Coming up on DTNS, Amazon wants you to learn machine learning by playing music. China ups its facial surveillance efforts and how VFX graphics differ between video games and movies. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, December 2nd, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And joining us, the host of comedy film nerds, Chris Mancini, back with us again. Good to have you back, Chris. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. We were uh, just discussing grocery stores and how Trader Joe's can get you dates, or at least dances. Uh, all kinds of things on Good Day Internet. You need that wider show that encompasses DTNS. If you want to have fun conversations like that, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The FBI Portland field office has posted a warning about the risks of buying a smart TV. The posting warns about surveillance by TV software makers through tracking your viewing habits, but also about attackers gaining access to home networks through unpatched smart TV operating systems. The FBI recommends placing black tape over an unused smart TV camera, keeping your smart TV up to date with the latest patches and fixes, and to read the privacy policy to better understand what your smart TV is capable of. A programmer created an open source algorithm to randomly generate secure passphrases in Welsh, which has the distinction of only having around 700,000 speakers worldwide. So that lowers the number of people that would guess the password by speaking in their native language. According to howsecureismypassword.net and myonelogin.net, it would take 11 Quattro decillion years or one trillion 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 years for a computer to crack various Welsh phrases. The programmer Alice warns, though, it's probably not a good idea to actually use this since the word list is freely available along with the algorithm being used. <laughs> uh, but Rhwifi and Bachandarhan. Ah, of course. One of my favorite holiday phrases. UBS and Formal Hout Techno Solutions estimate that the Huawei Mate 30 handsets are made without any U.S. parts. Huawei cybersecurity official John Suffolk told the Wall Street Journal that all of Huawei's 5G hardware is now also America free. Hmm. EU antitrust regulators are investigating how Facebook and Google's customer data is, quote, gathered, processed, used, and monetized, including for advertising purposes. Questionnaires have gone out to both companies as part of a preliminary investigation. AWS announced that it's expanding its Amazon Transcribe service to include support for medical speech. Amazon Transcribe Medical lets physicians dictate clinical notes in real time without having to use humans to intervene. Amazon Transcribe doesn't require prompts like comma or full stop. Notes can be fed into ER systems or other medical language services as well. Amazon Transcribe Medical is HIPAA compliant and charges based on usage with no upfront fees. Amazon Transcribe Medical is available in the U.S. East, North Virginia, and the U.S. West in Oregon regions. That's coming out of AWS reInvent happening in Las Vegas right now. Here's another story out of there. Amazon announced Deep Composer as a 32-key, two-octave keyboard for developers to use to learn generative adversarial networks, or GANs. It comes with pre-trained models, or you can develop your own. GANs are work by having two different neural networks play off each other in a sort of adversarial role uh, to learn whatever it is you want to learn. In this case, with Deep Composer, they learn to compose new and original digital works based on sample inputs. Developers can create music based on a model, tweak it in the Deep Composer console, which happens in the AWS cloud, then generate music. Uh, compositions can be shared on SoundCloud if you want. This joins Deep Lens, which is used for photography, and Deep Racer, which is used to make uh, faster cars, uh, which also teach machine learning. Developers interested in using Deep Composer can sign up for a preview whenever it's available. You'll get notified. It's not out there yet, though. I wonder about copyright issues when someone says, well, wait a second, this sounds like a sample from my song. And it's like, well, it was the machine. It wasn't really me at all. It was two machines talking to each other and learning from it. We're going to have to build a machine lawyer. <laughs> right? Yeah, just say, I know what you did, deep yeah. thinker machine. You <laughs> gan you. No, that, that's interesting. The, the copyright going that way wouldn't be too big of a deal, except for who do you sue? 
Do you mm -hmm. sue the developer? Because that's where copyright law is going to be a problem as more of these are used. Obviously, this is just used to teach machine learning. It's doubtful anybody comes up with some musical composition that's so great uh, that it that it's worth enough uh, to go after. But but eventually that that will be an issue of if an algorithm creates an, a work of art, who owns it? And a lot of people are trying to work on the legal theory behind that already before it becomes a problem. Yeah, the last thing we want are rich computers living in mansions. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the one percent become entirely yeah, virtual. Yeah, become a the AI. The AI is going to take over in multiple ways. Uh, but I, I think it's an interesting theory. But it's it's also things that are going on with all technology, like even like self driving cars. I mean, you guys have talked about that. Like you know, who's at fault when there's a crash on a self driving car? Um, but this is like you know, I think it's a similar thing. It's a creation issue of like, all right, well who created the machine that created the art like who's you know who's ultimately uh, uh the owner and yeah because it, even even uh, now with technology music technology which is you know vast you can still point back to the person or people who use the technology to create the work of art at what point do you sort of go well okay i was you know, I maybe started this whole cycle, but I didn't do any of this. Yeah, I right. pressed the button, but I was using Amazon's pre-trained model. Well, does Amazon have the copyright on it now then? How does that work? Yeah. Well, I, if you ask Amazon, I think you'd know the answer. Well, it depends on whether they're being sued for infringement or not. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of, not speaking of Amazon at all, I was trying to do a great segue <laughs> and it just didn't work. Facebook began rolling out a tool to let users in Ireland transfer photos from Facebook to Google Photos. The tool is based on code from the open source data transfer project, which includes Apple, Google, Microsoft, Twitter, and Facebook. Facebook plans for worldwide availability in the first half of 2020. The company also says it's starting with Google Photos and evaluating other services as well. Why, why Ireland was the... Uh... I imagine they started in Ireland because that's where their Facebook European headquarters is. Okay. And uh, data transfer is one of those best practices they can show they're being good citizens because, as we mentioned earlier in the show, Europe's going after them for regulatory concerns. So they want to start in Europe to say, like, no, no, data portability, we get it. It's the law now. We're going to make it happen so you can do this. Uh, and and like I said, that's that's where their headquarters is, uh, right there on the Liffey. So it's a real shame when you see you know governments really trying to curtail these small startup companies like <laughs> Facebook. It's really. <laughs> <laughs> this old David and Goliath thing. Yeah, I I've, I started to get really excited when I saw this story thinking like, oh, this is great. I'll be able to pull my my Facebook photos out and then realized I don't have that many photos on Facebook because I don't use it much anyway. And right. all the ones that are on there are on my camera roll, which is backed up with Apple and Google anyway. So, you know, they don't they don't live, spe you know, specifically on Facebook, the one the photos that you would want to keep. I don't think yeah, I mean, for, for, yeah. Yeah, for, for, I mean, pretty much everything that goes to Facebook is something that I'm posting on Instagram where I just do like the also want to post to Facebook and I go, yeah, OK, yeah, every once in a while, sure, I'll do it, that. Like even if you deleted your Facebook account, you wouldn't lose any photos. I don't think there's anything on Facebook except there are photos that I'm tagged in that other people have uploaded. And I'm pretty sure those photos only live on Facebook. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, some folks just, you know, they're, they're, people have all sorts of backup methods or not at all. And it's, it's, it's a good service, whether or not the company wanted to do this out of the goodness of their heart or yeah, you know, were forced to, that it's, 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 it's good to know that you've got options, you know, always got to take a backup of, important family photos, which are usually the ones that end up on Facebook anyway. If you are someone who looked at this and said, this, I definitely needed this, uh, send us a little email telling us why. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. As of December 1st, customers signing up for new mobile phone plans in China can have their face scanned to match with identity documents instead of having to submit a picture. China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology announced the change in September, which uses artificial intelligence and other technical methods to verify identity. Previously, your mobile plan required you to show your state ID and have a photo taken. Uh, so if if you weren't mad at the surveillance of this before, there's not much <laughs> more to get mad at here. They're just making it easier right. for them to grab they have, your photo. They have streamlined the effort of getting your photo. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, it can't be more transparent than that. We're taking a picture and storing it. They're pretty yeah, much it, saying that. Well, and, and, and honestly, it's like, 
you had to have a picture taken before, which was a little bit of a clunky process. Mm. Uh, now they're like, hey, you can just you can just be surveilled right there in the app. It's so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, what 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 do we need security cameras for? You've got your own now. Just yes, exactly. You, why why would we spend money, the state's money, setting up cameras when everyone's carrying one around? Uh, in, in all in all seriousness, this this is getting treated as like, oh, look at this expansion of surveillance. And I think in this case, it's not an expansion; it's it's an easing of surveillance. But it's it's something they were doing already. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in other Chinese news, according to leaked documents obtained by the Financial Times, Chinese companies like ZTE, Dahua, and China Telecom have proposed new international standards on facial recognition, video monitoring, city and vehicle surveillance to the UN's International Telecommunications Union. ITU standards are often adopted in developing nations in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, where the Chinese government supplies tech under its Belt and Road Initiative. Critics say that the proposals are more likely policy recommendations than technical standards. The facial recognition proposal would store facial data in a central database and suggest its use in public places by police, verifying worker attendance and comparing the country's fugitive library with the local population library. And Gadget notes that in June, a standard was accepted for streetlight design that included an option or video monitoring. Uh, for video monitoring, rather, ZTE and China Mobile proposed that standard themselves. Yeah, so if you... Like when they say policy recommendation, it makes it sound so less nefarious. It's like, oh, no, it's just a policy recommendation. We're just, well, yeah, just recommending it. I think what, what the critics are saying is this doesn't belong in the ITU. You shouldn't try to take a policy, a government policy, and slip it in as a standard, which is actually more nefarious because they're trying to say it's just a technical spec. What's the big deal? It's not like we're, right. but but the critics are saying, well, wait a minute. No, this is a policy of surveillance. Uh, we also had news today that the United States is going to require facial scans at the border for U.S. citizens. Right now, it only applies to uh, uh, non-U.S. citizens when they travel in and out of the United States. Uh, so this is this is something that is continuing to be a an issue that governments and companies are trying to use more and more because it's starting to work better and better. It's not perfect, but it's starting to work. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of people concerned about how it's used. I, I personally don't have a problem with facial recognition being used in certain cases, but it's never about the fact that it works. It's always about, yeah, but what else are you going to do with it? Okay. So you scan my face to make sure that my identity is me when I sign up for a new cell plan. Theoretically, I'm fine with that. Unless you're storing it in a central database, for instance, that could then be used for other things later, I may be less all right with that. Right. Now, the problem is, like, you don't always know whether or not that's happening. And in fact, you don't really. Well, because there's no <laughs> there's no oversight and safeguards on yeah. a lot of these programs, which to me, that's the real issue. It's not mm -hmm. I think people get a little bit their hair on fire about facial recognition uh, and and for, sometimes for the wrong reasons. But the the real reason to light your hair on fire, should you want to do that, don't do that, kids. It's a bad <laughs> idea. Uh, but if you want to if you want to have a concern, it's a concern about like oversight and who's in charge of this. What safeguards do we have? How do we know? that you're not going to use it for something else. And if we don't, then it shouldn't be put in place until we have systems for that. Yeah, I agree. And then if you really want to mess it up, just actually light your hair on fire. That will mess it up. <laughs> yeah. It'll, uh, it could lead to your facial recognition no longer Yeah, let me like, that yeah. doesn't look like you at all. Not sure it's worth it, though. Uh, <laughs> here's one of my favorite stories of the day. I, I We haven't mentioned Cyber Monday on this show because most of the news out there is about deals that by the time you hear this show, you probably won't be able to get anymore. So uh, there's always a little bit of a difficulty on a Cyber Monday finding other news out there, but this is a gem. NPR reports that dairy farmers in Massachusetts are using machines from Vanguard Renewables to generate electricity from food waste. It's a little bit of a roundabout process. So these are, you know, farmers who are selling their eggs and their cheese and their milk uh, to grocery stores in some mm -hmm. cases. And now the grocery stores are sending the food waste back to them. In Massachusetts, it's Whole Foods. Whole Foods stores are taking food waste that can't be used by food banks. So they try to donate it to somebody who can eat it first. But at a certain right. point, you just can't. Uh, and they put it in an industrial strength grinder. The resulting slurry is loaded on trucks, which deliver it back to the farmers who feed it into anaerobic digesters. 
Farmers also get food waste from other sources than grocery stores. Creameries, breweries, juice plants are some examples where they take food waste that can't be consumed and send it to the farmers. And then the waste is heated, releasing methane, which is captured and used to run a generator that burns methane. Farmers say, in general, they use around 10% of what is generated to power the farm, and then they feed the rest back into the grid, and byproducts from the process can be used as fertilizer. Thousands of digesters are in operation in Europe, and Vanguard hopes to expand their program beyond Massachusetts in the United States. Now, all anaerobic digesters are on sale for Cyber Monday, though. <laughs> Vanguard has a 50% off sale. Yeah, Plus, now's, it pays for now's the time to, to, to make your own farm, everybody. This is cool, though. I, yeah, I, you know, I was asking Tom and, and Roger before the show, okay, well, we're talking about Whole Foods. Amazon owns Whole Foods. Amazon's also expanding into the grocery market pr pretty substantially outside of the Whole Foods brand. Is this something that we're going to be seeing more and more of? And from what I can understand, it is, is a great way to stop a, a lot of food waste that's happening now. I, it's It's cool. It's a great way to recycle for sure, because all the stuff used to be just thrown away. Yeah, it's 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 a good example of taking the resources we have and instead of just plowing them into a landfill, well, I guess we're plowing them just into a farm uh, in this case, uh, but using it to to generate uh, generate electricity, which is good. And like you say, Sarah, uh, Amazon. I I actually tried out Amazon Fresh for the first time this morning. It's it's the service that you now get for free with your Prime membership if you have a minimum order of like thirty thirty five dollars, uh, and. I accidentally <laughs> ordered six bunches of bananas instead of just six bananas. But uh, so read the interface carefully. You're going to be uh, potassium high. Amazon Fresh and Amazon's Whole Foods together are going to have a lot of food waste. And I could see Amazon, even if they just use this themselves to, to generate electricity for their own warehouses, it's a, it's a way to engender sustainability. It'd be even better if they were able to, to give this to farmers to use in, in a Vanguard like program. You know, and, and I did after the recent fires in Northern California, which were, you know, luckily no one I know was, was, was deeply affected, but a lot of people were displaced. I did a, a volunteer night with world central kitchen and they were doing a thing like a big old feed at the fairgrounds. It was super fun and, you know, happy to be part of it. But I learned a lot from the volunteers who have done a lot more of this than me, how much like the food that was made that night was made by local chefs. I mean, it was, it was, it was good food. It was like a gourmet kind of thing, but I mean, maybe a third of it was eaten because we just made way more food than there were people there just, you know, to yeah. be safe. And there are very strict rules about where that food can go afterwards. Uh, meaning you can't even really drop it off at a shelter because it's been in a different kitchen and it's just, you know, there's just, uh, kind of, um, their health department, um, uh, restrictions. So this, this seems like it's just going in the right direction overall. Well, I think 10 years from now, you know, a choice is going to be made whether, all right, well, are we going to use Amazon's anaerobic digesters or Soylent Green, which is it going to be? <laughs> Spoiler. So yeah. like, no, I won't, I won't, I won't spoil. Uh, <laughs> folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, folks. Uh, Chris and I were emailing uh, uh, earlier this month uh, about the fact that you saw Midway, Chris. I saw Midway, yes. And and it was that wasn't the point of the conversation. Yes. It was it 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 spurred some observations about visual effects in you. It really did. And as a as a fan of like someone who loves movies and video games, you know, I've always uh, been interested in seeing how you know each medium progresses. But then when I see crossover in the wrong way for movies or video games, it really um, kind of misses the point. Like Midway was a big giant spectacle of explosions and, you know, it's a Roland Emmerich film. So I, I got that, I expected it. But we got to the point in that film where the actors were secondary to like, I was watching one cutscene after another for video games. To the point where too, with visual effects, um, you could see the assets being reused <laughs> at some point. It was like, oh, that's a plane hit the uh, deck and then went into the ocean. Uh, from an aircraft carrier. And it, when you see that kind of same sequence multiple times, you realize, well, this is just, these are art assets just being reused to fill time. And um, one of the things I always noticed and that I always make this 
point when I was talking about movies or even video games on the podcast is that um, each one, a video game or a movie, invokes a different emotion. And that emotion is, um, is very critical to the actual medium. Like when you're playing a video game, it's um, a immersive experience, whereas you're, when you're watching a film, it's more passive. So if you use techniques incorrectly from each one, it actually takes you out of the experience and makes you more detached from it. Like if the visual effects were more seamlessly integrated to the performance of the actors in the film, you would be more emotionally attached. And if you have cutscenes in a video game that are more designed to keep you in part as part of the action, then you're more immersed on the video game side. But when you have long detached cutscenes in video games, it detaches you. And when you have long cutscenes in a movie that look like cutscenes in a uh, uh, from a video game that you're completely detached from anything, then it, it removes you as well. So I think it's like sometimes everyone gets drunk on the technology. We're like just bigger, bigger, faster, more. And that's not really the case. The medium has to be respected first. So uh, especially with a movie like Midway, and I remember like everyone's comparing it to Pearl Harbor. Yes, that's not incorrect. <laughs> but um, but you see the difference in visual effects that that kind of like um, one up and like, well, you know, now it's Midway, it's Roland Emmerich, it's got to look insane. And it's got to be full of explosions and giant things happening when that's really not the case. I mean, if you had a really cool story that was grounded with the characters and then the visual effects were layered on top of that, it would have been a much more, um, you know, emotional experience as a film. And it, and it wasn't. Well, the two things strike me out of that. One is the uh, Battle of Midway. I always learned from both my my father, who was in the Navy and, and in history class, uh, which was taught by a teacher in junior high that was in the Navy, that the biggest thing about Midway was the ships never saw each other because they were too far away. It was it was fought entirely in the air. And I feel like they they, they may have missed a really I never would have gotten that from the film so. component. Right. Is 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 that sort of detachment? Uh, by yes. doing that. Uh, but the second thing is it, it's I, I'm curious because I haven't seen the movie is the problem that if when you say cutscenes are the the things that look like cutscenes in midway scenes that just don't have humans or if they have humans in them, they're not they're not the center, right? They're they're just sort of being blown up or or screaming or something. Absolutely. But it's also more of the uh, the spectacle of it, like everything where, you know, everything is a close up on an explosion where, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't feel that that grounded feel to it. Like a uh, a good example is like, say, like a war game like Call of Duty, you know, where the cutscenes still kind of immerse you and the characters actually in them. Whereas Midway and this was how poorly it missed the mark or how much it missed the mark. Like Midway was actually based on certain real life people in the actual movie like you know at the end they always have the credits like this happened to this person whatever but the movie was so detached from any kind of emotion or attachment with these characters that when you saw the cutscene, it actually made those characters seem unbelievable like oh these are hollywood made up characters and like oh no these are real people but the the way the movie is presented made them actually feel like they weren't even real when they actually were <laughs> the other thing i've noticed and this isn't even a vfx thing so much uh is writing in shows and movies sometimes feeling like a non-player character speaking to you uh when you when you go when you have a cutscene with an npc that says we're either gonna have to go up the hill or we're just gonna have to bail out you All know right. like oh that that's bad exposition but it's on purpose because yeah. i have a decision i'm gonna have to make as a player but i'm starting i see that creeping into to movies and tv shows too oh yeah for sure and it's uh it's like we call those the exposition characters it's like, well, your sole purpose is to uh, specifically move the plot along in a very inorganic way. It's like, well, you, we, we can't go down that road because, you know, there's an ambush. So we'll have to go down this road. And then, um, you know, I'm I'm um, you know, I'm detached because I had a terrible childhood. And uh, this is why I can't connect with anyone emotionally. You know, when characters say that, it kind of ruins the point of, I don't know, storytelling. <laughs> Well, one of the uh, one of the the key mantras, at least that I've heard from people who work in the industry, is that um, the point of the point of any effects, whether it's visual effects, practical effects, or anything, 
is that it shouldn't call attention to itself. It shouldn't say, I have a special effect. I'm a visual. It should be as if the world was totally organic. That should, to kind of add to that verisimilitude where, oh, I totally believe I'm in the world of Marvel Comics and yes. you know aliens are coming down and the Hulk is breaking through stuff. It shouldn't look like you were saying, like in a video game where, well, okay, here comes the cutscene, exposition, lead on mm-hmm. to the next mission. Okay, let's, where do I press go? Let me play. Uh, and that, that's, a, that's a great point because especially with Midway specifically it felt like you were getting all the visual effects from either a video game or even like a Marvel movie like with an alien invasion so mm-hmm. nothing looked grounded or realistic or any of it I mean it was all just uh, about how how do we make it bigger and how do we make it more um, explos- explosionary I don't know if that's a word but uh, uh, Ex- so, we want exposition yeah. not explosion is yes. that what you're trying to say <laughs> So and uh, but but stuff like that is it really struck me because I felt like I, you know, I was watching Midway looking for a controller in front of me because, uh-huh. right, well, the cutscene's over and now I'm like, OK, well, now I have now to, what do I do? There's a, yeah. now, there's a dialogue tree with these, you know, wooden actors that uh, I can't see. And uh, um, it, it's really as these both have evolved video games and films and we've seen the way uh, effects can be layered. You know, there's video games that do it absolutely beautifully. Everything from like a Last of Us to, you mm-hmm. know, uh, the last Call of Duty got mixed reviews, but I felt like that was a really immersive, um, you know, World War II game. Uh, but you know, this uh, the the filmmakers should be learning lessons from film, um, not from you know video games and and vice versa. Where is because they're two different experiences and two different you know emotions when they try to. Um, I remember remember when CD-ROMs first started. Yeah, and uh, that was that one of the things that they did because the technology was new. Mist used it beautifully. Like we're using full motion video and we're putting it together. We're using the technology to tell a story specific to this. Like no one's going to go to the movies and watch Mist. You know, that's it was used perfectly. But then there was a rash of like um, CD-ROM video games that all they did had was full motion video on them with um, cheap actors and sets and stuff that they could get away with very cheaply and then you would just go around from room to room to trigger the next scene i felt like that was like well no you guys have learned the wrong lesson here Mm -hmm. and uh, i think that's kind of what we're seeing with um certain filmmaking where and i really think it's um um you could really look at the marvel movies where there's that great mix of like oh this spectacle belongs here but it's also grounded with the characters indeed well, thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. A lot of stories just like the one we talked about are kicked around in our subreddit every day. You can submit your own and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Join in on the conversation in our Discord as well, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check in with Chris Christensen, who has a social tip for travelers to help each other get deals on electronics. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I'm not sure if you've heard of the Grabber app. That's G-R-A-B-R at Grabber.io. But Grabber is an interesting app. You've run into those things where the iPhone goes on sale here, but you're in a different country, so you can't get it. Or, gee, I loved those things that I bought when I was in Italy, but I can't get there and I can't find them online. Grabber is an app that connects shoppers with travelers. And the idea is that you can shop for someone, getting the thing you can only get in your country because you happen to be traveling to their country. And you can bring it to them and they will pay you for it. You register what trips you have and other people register what stuff they need and the app tries to connect you. But you have to get over that whole thing of shopping for other people with your money. And I'm not sure I can. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I'm with I'm with Chris there. I I would want someone to do this for me. I'm not sure I'd be the person on the other end buying the thing for them. Right. And then they just don't show up at that place that you had predetermined earlier you'd both be yeah, at. I'm, I'm you know? like any yeah. site they they probably yeah. got systems in place to refund you if There's that sort of insurance. thing happens, right? Yeah. Otherwise they they'd be gone in a second, but it does it's it's makes me a little nervous. Mm. 
But if you got trusted folks around the world, hey, seems like an interesting way to do stuff. Hey, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Shane, Jeffrey Zilks, and Paul Reese. Also, thanks to Chris Mancini for being with us today. Chris, I think we decided it had been about eight months since you were with us. Too yes. long. Thanks for being back. And what's been going on with you and how can people keep up with your work? Well, uh, we have the final comedy film nerds show that uh, will be December 12th and uh, at the Hayworth Theater that Tom will be a guest on. I can't wait to be there. Yeah. And uh, but the main thing I have right now that only has a week left that I really want to tell people about is my new Kickstarter for my graphic novel, Rise of the Kung Fu Dragon Master. Ooh. And it is a um, it is a really fun um, kind of like an action comedy, like a Big Trouble in Little China and uh, like 80s buddy comedies, Army Darkness, and it's kind of a follow-up to my first graphic novel that was actually helped funded by a Daily Tech News show of viewers and cord cutters called Long Ago and Far Away. Tom has one right there. And this will be put out by uh, Starburns Press. They do, um, Starburns does uh, Rick and Morty, Animals, and uh, Anomalisa, they're an animation house. They have a print division, but uh, we need to get it funded first, so we've got until December 10th, and we need help for sure. And you can go there at uh, Kickstarter and type in Rise of the Kung Fu Dragon Master, or you could just go to comedyfilmnerds.com and click a link there. You could watch a video, check out all the rewards. If you just want to grab the digital book or a physical book, but there's also cool rewards too. If you're an animation fan, you could get a tour of Starburns and see how they make animation. You could be on the last Comedy Film Nerds show with Tom. You could, uh, I, I will say, you know what? If it's a Daily Tech News show listener, I will sit them next to you. <laughs> Fantastic, as as it should be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so there's a lot of cool rewards, but uh, you know, Kickstarter is always a ticking clock, so we only have till December 10th, and we've got a fair amount of uh, time to go because it is a big 160 page book. So we'd love to get as much help from uh, the viewers as possible. Yeah, uh, long ago and far away uh, was really really cool. If you if you haven't checked it out, uh, you should take a look for it as well. But first things first is to get Rise of the Kung Fu Dragon Master uh, funded. So head on over to Kickstarter.com, folks, and make that happen. Maybe you'd be sitting next to me at the last Comedy Film Nerds. Uh, it could be amazing. Uh, go it's check really that fun. out. Uh, we also have new Patreon reward merchandise to celebrate six years of Daily Tech News Show. Len Peralta created a six-year anniversary DTNS logo. And if you back certain levels at patreon.com slash DTNS for three months, you'll get a sticker, a poster, a mug, or a t-shirt with that logo on it. Get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. And of course, you can always support our show at any level at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. You can also send us feedback. In fact, we love it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is our email address. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more and tell a friend, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>